We've watched the tape and Bengals underscore Sands Mike Santagata joins us to break down the takeaways about Joe Burrow, the offensive line, and this Bengals defense. You are locked on Bengals, your daily Cincinnati Bengals podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, Bengals fans, and welcome to another episode of the Locked On Bengals podcast. It's almost time to move ahead to week three in those New York Jets. We're going to take one more episode, having watched the All-22, watched the coaches film to get into some of the takeaways and become a little bit clearer when you can see everything that's happening on the field. I'm Jake Lisko, joined by James Rapine and our film buddy. Mike Santagata at Bengals underscore Sands on Twitter. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network here on Locked On Bengals, covering the Bengals every day, free and available everywhere you get your podcasts and on YouTube. Make sure you follow, make sure you subscribe, make sure you hit the bell on YouTube, as the kids say. And we appreciate ring, all of you. It's ring the bell, old man. It's ah, ring the bell. Shoot. So close. We appreciate all of you who make us your first listen. We're brought to you today by LinkedIn, LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. Guys, let's get into the quarterback, Joe Burrow. I've been hard on Joe Burrow. I watched the all 22. My stance softened a little bit. My overall feeling that Burrow's clock is too fast remains. You can see it in the way that he's breaking down and becoming a runner in the pocket at times. And the magic that he had last year of escaping, breaking contain and making plays outside of structure consistently has been diminished a little bit so far, much like it was at the beginning of 2021. Mike, you've watched the offense. What do you think about Joe Burrow? What's going on? Yeah, with Burrow, I definitely think the clock is a tick fast. Um, Now, you could argue the wide receivers aren't getting open quick enough because he doesn't right now want to get to the bottom of his drop, hitch, maybe even hitch again before throwing. He's getting to the bottom of his drop, seeing nobody's open and saying, I can't trust these guys in front of me (laughs) and trying to go make a play. And the Cowboys did a pretty good job of limiting him being able to get outside of the pocket. Um, They were doing a few different defensive things, whether that was uh, odd mirror five, which is just putting a spy up there or mush rushing from the outside, making sure that they have contain just different things so that he was never escaping outside other than the touchdown. Um, But that's why he would, look to go outside. There's nothing there. Then all of his runs pretty much came right up the middle because that's where the room was. But overall, the wide receivers, they could win a tick quicker on these tight man coverage plays, but also Burrow could hang in the pocket a second longer. And really it all comes down back to the offensive line could win more often and make him feel comfortable. (laughs) Unfortunately, yeah, we're still talking about the offensive line, which, as Jake has referenced throughout the week, for those that haven't listened, was like one of my top goals was to not talk about it, but we are talking about it. And we'll talk more about it coming up in just a bit. Uh, going back and watching, Mike, that one thing that, at least a big point in the game to me, Burrow misses, and they end up converting. It was during that, what, 18 play drive or 19 play drive or whatever it was, the crazy drive at the end there to tie the game. But he misses a couple throws that are just – he airmailed them. And I want to ask you about those. What was what was that? Was his footwork off? What was off there? Because there were a couple throws where he's just way high. I, I think both receivers were open in real time, I thought so. So do you know the, the throws I'm talking about and, and what happened on those plays? Yeah, not even just missed throws. I think um, – I can't speak too much to the mechanics. Don't consider myself too much of a quarterback sure. mechanics expert. But – for whatever reason, he wasn't as accurate and deadly precise as he usually is. Uh, I know the two throws you're talking about. I believe one was down the sideline, and he missed that one down the sideline last week too. So this could just be him getting knocking some rust off. He didn't throw that much during practice because of the appendix. He didn't play in any preseason games. So, you know, maybe he's just getting back into it. But it could also be just related to he's not trusting what's in front of him. Maybe he quickens it up a little bit, doesn't get all his cleats in the ground, something like that. I do think also he wasn't – even on one completion I can think of, they ran um, 
basically what, what I call flat seven, which is like smash, except you get a corner route and then a flat route from the inside, the corners from the outside. And he throws it great decision a little bit late uh, to Hayden Hurst, but it's high. So Hurst has to reach up and grab it. And then instead of it being, you know, catch it at three yards, turn up field and you're one-on-one with a corner, he catches it at three yards, but he has to stretch to catch it comes down. He's almost out of bounds so by the time he could turn up field, he pretty much just gets run out of bounds within a yard or two. So bringing that pass down, getting a little bit quicker on that read, and just in general, just getting the accuracy down because that's one of the things that makes him special. It's an interesting juxtaposition to me from week one to week two, where in week one, there are a few times where, to me, he's taking an extra hitch and some windows are closing that don't need to close. Some of his interceptions come on – late throws or some of them certainly on balls he should not have thrown at all in week two there's maybe one play where it feels like there's an extra hitch and other than that it feels like it's it's kind of a a pendulum swing right where in week one you see the over aggression trying to fit the ball into windows and and maybe being late sometimes to ball comes out lightning quick fastest time to throw in the nfl in week two fastest time to scramble he only had three so small sample size but fastest time to scramble in the nfl in week two but the time to sack is is right around average when you go look at those PFF numbers and, and what they track there. The pressure to sack number really high as well. What what do you think the the difference from week one to week two is for Burrow? And, and where do you think he goes from here? Because, again, to me, it wasn't as bad when I could see what was happening downfield. There's some plays where I thought it looked like terrible pocket management when I was watching the All-20, when I was watching live, and then I watched the All-22, and there's nothing downfield. And it doesn't look like it's coming open when he chooses to run. And then there's other plays where he's running into sacks. So some of some constants, but very different styles for Burrow from week one to week two. Yeah, I don't want to say this too often, but there were a lot of uh, sacks to look at. So uh, some of them were nobody was open. He's trying to make something happen. Some of them I felt like something was there. Now, some of them required a real this is a throw that Burrow would make, but I think of the Cowboys ran that out of your five. So they have the quarterback spy Parsons comes inside. It's a watch me stunt. So then the defensive tackle goes outside to contain. So when Burrow feels Parsons come inside, he thinks, Oh, I'll go create outside because the edge rusher just came inside on me. But then he sees the tackles there. So then he stops and tries to get up field, but then there's a spy. Really what you want there is a step to the inside and then keep your feet and throw yeah. because T Higgins is open on the dig, but even last year, especially in the back half of the year, I would see Burrow more so go to run, see that, Oh crap. They've, this is what they wanted, but then he could quickly set his feet, quick titch, Mm -hmm. quick twitch and fire that ball in there. So that's a difficult throw, but it's one that I expect Burrow to be able to make. And then, um, and it's one that you've shown before too, that ability to reset. Yeah, he's really good at resetting his feet for the most part. So that's why I really do think he could have made that throw. And yeah, like you said, there are plays, nothing's open. And I do think that sometimes it did come open, but it would be after pressure. And right now, when he feels pressure, he's looking and seeing like, okay, I'm going to go down because I've taken seven sacks last week, probably what, three, four by the time he's doing this type of stuff. Although fourth play of the game, he kind of took off a little early, but there was nothing. There really wasn't much there that play. Mm -hmm. I think that might've been a little bit of a design thing because I felt like T beat his man, but they had two guys in the middle of the field because one of them was just sitting there as the cover one hole. But then the other guy is sitting there because Hayden Hurst route was like, three yards and sit right in the middle of the field. So why do you have an inbreaker coming behind that? But anyway, I I think for the most part, I'm not too concerned that this lasts forever. I think it is a bit of the pendulum where last week he's late. He's forcing throws this week. He quickens up. He's missing some stuff, but he's not turning the ball over. So then this coming week against the jets, can he write, can he hit that balance? Cause what you're looking for is somewhere in the middle of those two. Yeah, and he talked about the turnovers after the game and who knows how much, by the way, almost turned the ball over, right? The strip sack, it's just Mixon happened to be there, right? I mean, that's that's one of of those plays I think that gets lost in the shuffle when, and it did for me. I I didn't forget about it, but it it was kind of buried until I went back and watched. Well, we talked about the offensive line at the top. We've talked about it for years here on Locked on Bengals, and we're going to talk about it again next because – 
Well, there's a lot of issues, a lot, a lot of issues. So we'll dive into that. But first, if you're having issues finding help for your small business, quality workers, well, LinkedIn Jobs is here to make it easier to find the people you want to talk to faster and for free. Create a free job post in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs to reach your network and beyond to the world's largest professional network of over 810 million people. You can add your job and the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring so your network can help find the right people for you to hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. And right now, LinkedIn Jobs is going to help you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn every week. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions do apply. Offensive line, huh? We're doing this again. <laughs> We're doing this year. Time again. is a flat circle, Jake. It just We're, goes round and round and round. Flat circle, Groundhog Day, Palm Springs. You guys, was it Palm Springs? You guys, Palm Springs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that that oh, that's a Jake. Let's go special right there. I bet you you've watched that five times. One time, I enjoyed that. Uh, <laughs> it's a good, a good movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sandberg. I, I used to not like Andy. He's he really grew on me. Uh, Brooklyn yeah, Nine Nine. Yeah. Anyway, we're we're talking offensive line again here on Locked On Bengals. We're talking with Bengals Sands. He he likes to talk offensive line. Unfortunately, we uh, have a tackle issue. It would seem in Cincinnati. Jonah Williams has this problem where he's fine for ninety percent of the game and then has like three disaster reps in pass pro. Lel Collins. Well, Mike, you talked about this when the Bengals signed him, oversetting a little bit, and boy, did Micah Parsons punish that tendency big time against the Bengals in week two. When you're looking at this offensive line, to me, I'm not quite alarmed, but there's some concern growing specifically with the tackles. What do you think is going on there? What needs to be corrected? So I'm still not that concerned about Jonah. I I feel like maybe I should be because he is playing below the level he played last year. I think I've lost some of the hope that he's going to suddenly become one of the top five, eight tackles in the league, but left tackles in the league. (laughs) Yeah, There was a lot of talk about that with the the trends, the tendencies. He was looking better at the end of last year. And then, yeah, I think I've lost that. But I think he gets back to being solid. I don't think that it's going to be terrible forever. He's not terrible either. Just I don't think he'll play below average forever. Um, Collins, I have some concern. He missed a lot of time with injury. And, you know, it could be something that actually is lingering. It could be something that was a bigger issue than we all thought because we don't have, you know, medical history, all this other type of stuff with him. Bengals felt like it was good enough to bring him in. But, yeah, this is two bad games in a row. And, I mean, when you look back at Collins – career even when he was benched last year these games are probably worse than that so not great and he doesn't look very athletic right now he's oversetting and he doesn't feel like he has good balance at all he's falling down on probably more than 50 percent of plays intentionally it seems (laughs) sometimes diving yeah sometimes diving to push the guy around the pocket which is a move that's that's a unique move (laughs) but uh it's That one, I have some growing concern. I'm not hitting the panic alarm, asking to start a Denigy, anything like that yet. But I, (laughs) I have, I have some concern. Yeah, I'm not there yet. I have some. He was inactive, by the way, so he is not. You know, I guess I should say Smith. (laughs) But uh, yeah, I, I have some concern. I'm not fully panicked. I'm not. I don't even know if I'd say I'm alarmed, but I do have some concern that's like, oh, I'm not sure we're getting the Lyle Collins from Dallas that he was. Okay, so even if they're not getting that, though, do you think, and obviously you're not pressing panic, how can he become salvageable, which means serviceable? Because I wasn't expecting a Pro Bowl type year out of Lyle Collins, especially after what I saw during camp. It was just kind of like, yeah, yeah. This guy is, is trying to get to week one. And and so it has been an ugly couple of weeks. What does he need to change, Sands, to be just solid, just serviceable, just the Riley Reef that we got in the first, what, seven games last year, something like that? Because I don't think Collins has been that through two weeks. 
find a way, get a little bit more flexible. He's always been a little bit stiff, but he looks extra stiff. It's just a lot of the things that look like negatives in Dallas, oversetting, a little stiff, a little top heavy. They've turned into big negatives and kind of uh, patterns. So if he can get a limber up a little bit, that could be an injury yoga? thing. A little yoga? Yeah, yoga, a little yoga, uh, a right. little balance. I don't know if it's an ankle thing. I know there was, a, there was tape gate yep. where he had his yep. ankles taped yes. a few times. So maybe that will get better over time and then he won't feel the need to dive out there or fall down all the time. And maybe he feels more comfortable on his ankles on keeping his base solid and working mirroring back to the inside. Never thought that was an issue with him to mirror back inside. He is doing spin moves to mirror back inside right now for the most part. Um, overall, just very unorthodox in that that's what makes me think that this could be an injury type thing. Cause this isn't what he was doing in Dallas. He might be trying to play through something. He might, might just be not, you know, it could be, he's rusty. It could be, he's not, doesn't have a feel for game speed right now. There's, there's a few explanations. I would hope that it just gets better with time. Um, technically. Yeah. It's just being top heavy diving and doing all these weird moves that, aren't really helping him too much. I will say he's still powerful in the run game. He was able to move some guys. So there's, there's definitely hope in the run game, but I know that that's not what people care about. And they care about how can he get back to being a good pass protector. And that comes with, he's a little bit more explosive off the line. He gets the cadence down. He limbers up. He's able to mirror back inside, keep flexible and balanced. Real Real quick, real quick, Jake, just take three seconds. Bobby Hart is not walking through that door. In fact, Bobby Hart was suspended for one game by the NFL. It was just released. They they made the announcement. And yes, wow. the Bill Star will miss star. a game. Go ahead. I just uh, we're talking offensive line. I had to give an update on Bobby Hart. It could um, be worse, lady. Bobby Hart could be walking through that door. I, I have so another. It could, it could be worse. I, I have two other former Bengals offensive line updates. Oh, if we're gosh. doing that. Okay. Uh, Andrew Whitworth replied to a tweet of mine and had a one word response. He said, agreed. And this was in response to my opinion of Joe Burrow after reviewing the all 22. So that felt good for me. And a little shout out for Sands, myself and our friend, Joe Goodberry. Big Willie was asked a question about the snap cadence and Willie goes, you know, Jake Sands and Joe watch more tape than me. Go ask those guys. So a couple of former Bengals linemen showing some love to some of the members of this podcast. Love it. I also think it's funny how you twisted me breaking Bobby Hart news <laughs> into anyways. No, I, I, I saw, I, I saw a window and I took it, man. I, I agree with Willie and, and, uh, and then obviously Andrew Whitworth. I, he's been fun, a fun ad to Twitter. So I'm yeah. glad he agreed with you. I, I know when he followed you, it made you feel all bubbly. So I can't oh, imagine yeah. when you saw he replied to you, how you felt. Oh, he's done it before, but this was this was like the validating reply. The it felt good. Yeah. Uh, Lel Collins. By the way, is he walking through that door? Can you just DM him? I'll try. And just be like, "Hey, Andrew." Like the, all the other I, Bengals fans that are also trying. I, I, how's ten million sound? Yeah. Uh, probably not enough, right? I, I imagine he had a bigger offer. No, it right? wasn't enough in 2016. It's not yeah. enough now. I don't. Uh, <laughs> Collins, like you said, Mike was good against the run. Some other positives on this offensive line besides Collins being good against the run and reason for hope for Collins, by the way, like, I think that's the worst game he's ever played. And his first two games were against two of the best, maybe probably two of the best, if not the two best edge rushers in the NFL and TJ Watt and Micah Parsons. And I know Miles Garrett is coming, but he'll he'll rush from the other side. Anyway, some reasons for hope there, I think, for Collins to get back into form. Cordell Volson, big step up for him, especially in pass pro. Ted Karras, Alex Kappa remain consistent. And I think we'll come back to those guys and talk a little bit about Jonah Williams before we dive into uh, some of the some of the stuff going on with the defense coming up to finish the show next. But first. Bet online still has you covered for all of your betting needs in 2022. Did you know that the Cincinnati Bengals are currently plus 275 to win the AFC North? If you are and you're listening to Locked On Bengals, holding that faith and still confident in the Cincinnati Bengals, especially after watching that Ravens meltdown to Miami, and you want to put your money on the Bengals, Bet Online has you covered. 
They have you covered for all of your betting needs and sports info this season, whether it's college or pro football, whether it's the major league baseball season, whether it's, well, pretty much anything they've got you covered. Go check it out at betonline.net. You can check out all the trends, all the action, all the odds. Bet online is where the game starts. Schultz and Sons Diamonds. And you've heard us talk about Schultz and Sons Diamonds a lot here. We're excited to partner with a local company and Bengals fans. That's right. Matt and his family are huge Bengals fans. They've been season ticket holders for generations. And if you're looking for the absolute diamond experts in the Cincinnati area, and why wouldn't you? Then you need to go to Schultz and Sons right now. Where are they located? Well, it's simple. They're located in Kroger Plaza in Fort Mitchell, which is right off the highway. It's not far at all from PBS or Paycor Stadium, if we're going to call it by its actual name. So if you're in town for maybe that Thursday game against Miami and you're going to spend the weekend in Cincinnati, you need a little bling, well, Schultz & Sons has you covered. And they're a part of the American Gem Society, for those wondering. One in 20 jewelers meet the requirements to be part of AGS. One in 20. Schultz & Sons is one of them. So when we say they're the leading experts in Cincinnati, they are the leading jewelry experts in Cincinnati. Schultz & Sons is located, like I said, in Kroger Plaza and Fort Mitchell. When you're looking for that special piece for a loved one or for yourself, stop by and tell them that you too are a Bengals fan. Check out SchultzDiamonds.com. That's S-C-H-U-L-Z Diamonds.com. Can't wait for everybody to get their hot take chains. And people are going to start coming up to you at games, James, and go, hey, man. I went down to Schultz and Sons. I got my hot take chain. Check it out. I, I can't wait either. It's hot a take whole... chain. No, notice, notice for our YouTube audience, hot take chain hasn't been out in a little bit because we're in the lab. We're in the Schultz and Sons lab. <laughs> Don't you worry. It's coming. Exciting it's coming. stuff. Yeah, Mike, before is. we talk about this defense and how great DJ Reader is, best. No, best you don't get a chain, Mike. NFL. Offensive linemen don't get a chain. You don't get a chain, man. It's for the flashy possession, you know, wide receivers, flashy positions. I think there was a coach that one James. time there was a coach that one time poured syrup in his lineman's mouth after they got pancakes. <laughs> Different Sweet. kind of flash. A sugary That's flash. Right. Uh let, let's finish up on the offensive line, Mike, with a couple of reasons for optimism. We're a little bit late getting here, later than I've wanted to be before we had some encouraging notes. And I think Lel Collins' run blocking is one of them that tells you he's not washed. But Cordell Volson, Ted Karras, Alex Kappa, obviously little things to clean up here and there for everybody, but I thought those guys played pretty well in week two and real signs of encouragement for the rookie Cordell Volson. Yeah, especially pass protection. Now, I know Jeff Schwartz made a good point that these guys are setting a little deep a little too often. And that's making a little bit of a constricted constriction for Joe Burrow. But what they're doing is working because uh, they were the ones that had no issue in that game. I mean, you could talk about a couple pressures here and there from all from all three, but I don't remember them giving up a single sack. Uh, I don't remember there being too much pressure knocking Burrow off his spot from the middle. Overall, they look solid. I know it's not the biggest competition with the Dallas interior. It's a lot of guys that can flash, but they're mostly just solid interior players. Parsons did get a few rushes over the middle, and they were able to handle them, unlike the outside. <laughs> um, like some Maje P. Ryan. Ryan that, I, I'll, I'll like Parsons. That's Sorry. right. <laughs> um yeah, so I think all of them are solid in pass, which is really what you want. You don't need your guy just dominating every single rep in pass protection. What you need from all five of these guys is to be solid. And then in the run game, I thought Kappa had some really nice double teams with uh, Collins. I thought Karras, he gets there and he can get himself in good position. He's not – he's the, the class A – Howard Mudd used to say that uh, almost every block at the NFL level is a stalemate. It's just about winning leverage. Now, Collins, he's a guy that he doesn't get stalemates as often. He, he's winning big sometimes. But with guys like Karras and Jonah and even Volson, it's more about getting in there, getting right leverage. And they were able to do that a lot. Um, I think Karras a little bit more than Volson, but that's hey, he's a rookie and he just had a good pass protection game after we had a little bit of worry with him against Cam Hayward. I think all those guys are solid. I think they're good in both the run and pass. And uh, I think they are the interior for the rest of the season, at least. I mean, 
I saw some talk about signing Quentin Spain after the game, and I was like, uh, I think Volson just had a good game, guys. <laughs> he did. No, he did. You know why? Because we didn't notice him. And I'm sick of noticing these guys. And I didn't notice the interior at all, and that's how I know. And that's how Ted Karras wants it. By the way, in free agency, Ted Karras was easily third behind Kappa and Collins and how people mentioned in excitement level wise. And he's been, not only is he a captain and all the intangibles and stuff, but he's blocking pretty well. So Teddy K keep it up. Yeah. Just like DJ reader can keep it up as he continues to play, you like know, the why? best player at his position. It, they were kicking each other's at, but ooh, I almost got every, everyone in trouble. They would have came after me with pitchforks. They were kicking each other's butts one-on-one in camp. So I think that's why those guys are off to a great start. DJ Reader continues to play because of the fierce competition on the interior with Alex Kaffa and Ted Karras. With Ted Karras. Probably his own just immense skill. Really, really good football. Playing like the best nose tackle in football. One of the best run defenders in the game and probably the Bengals' best pass rusher through two games. Uh, which is a mixed bag there because no, that's not hand, good. That's uh, not good. It's nice that DJ reader is showing those pass rushing chops. And on the other hand, uh, like you said, James, that might not be so good. Mike, what's going on with this defensive front and their ability to get pressure? Uh, I mean, yeah, Trey Anderson got a little bit more attention than normal, but I think a little bit of that is just also Trey Anderson hasn't looked like Trey Hendrickson either. I mean, Dan Moore and uh, a rookie Tyler, uh smith smith there we go <laughs> a rookie tyler smith who i feel like duke Mannyweather comes online and says like he's a guard after every game he's like he played solo but he's a guard and i'm just like if you're one of the top 10 pass rushers in this league you have to take a guy that's solid but a guard and another guy that probably wouldn't start on 30 nfl teams and you have to take him to the woodshed not just like a couple wins here and there, which he's able to do, but like you have to dominate these guys when you get those one-on-one -on -one opportunities like TJ Watt was able to do against the Bengals and Cam Hayward. So I think there could be, who knows that he had some time off, you know, it could be rust. It, all these guys could just be rusty because they didn't play in the preseason. I know he didn't practice with the team early. He practiced and dominated in practice. So who knows? <laughs> that could just be the offensive line of the Bengals and the backups were not playing the best practice. But I think he gets back to being the best pass rusher on the team. I'd probably say he still is uh, because DJ Reader's winning against the Kevin Dotsons. And I don't know the Cowboys left guard uh, off the top of my head. That is Matt Farniak. Matt yeah. Farniak. He's able to beat Matt Farniak and <laughs> uh, Kevin Dotson. But um yeah, those, that's not the highest competition. Neither is what Trey Hendricks is facing, but Trey Hendricks gets a little bit more attention sometimes. Uh, but he is showing chops. I mean, if you can get your nose tackle to take advantage of these matchups and get multiple pressures every game, that that's just gravy on top. He's already got the beef and the potatoes, and then you had pass rushing. I mean, this, we are talking best nose tackle of football. It's him, Kenny Clark, and Vita Vea, and uh, I think it'd be hard to say that it's not DJ Reader right now. He is on another level. Now I want some gravy on top of some mashed potatoes and, and a little meatloaf. And anyways, uh, you got me hungry, Sands. Um, I got a, a question for you, and it's it's kind of an important one. And it's one that a lot of people were wondering at about the game kicked off at 425. The Cowboys drove 12 plays. I don't know how long the drive was off the top of my head. But that final play, especially after the fourth down conversion, it was and then the touchdown. Where's Jesse Bates been? Because all, all offseason, all offseason, Jesse Bates, Jesse Bates, Jesse Bates. Franchise tag, doesn't want it, wants to get a deal done, all that stuff. I'll be honest with you. I've noticed Jesse Bates as much as I've noticed Dax Hill. And Dax Hill has like nine defensive snaps. So, you know, there you go. He almost had that pick. I guess if he comes down with that and Eli doesn't get called for holding, we're having a different conversation. But here's the other thing: he's almost had a lot of picks. <laughs> I, I, I think of that forty million game, yeah. dollar players catch the picks, and I'm not even hey, trying to be mean to Jesse. You got to catch, catch him, him Go in ahead. the playoffs. He had glue hands. He got stick them in the playoffs. They need to find the, that order where, again. Where the hell's the stick them? <laughs> something to do with Lester Hayes, but. uh <laughs> 
But uh, uh, Jesse Bates, I feel like this is something we all talked about where he didn't practice the, I, I sound like a broken record, but yeah, it's to me, that one is rust. His touchdown he lets up, he's just slow to react to what's happening in front of him and to match the receiver in coverage. And Jesse mm-hmm. Bates has never been an elite athlete. He's a good athlete. He's a functional athlete, but he's never been the guy that a guy comes up to him, breaks off, and they can gain a little separation. And he's quickly closing that. He takes his he, – he not takes his time, but it takes him time. Like he's giving 100%. I don't want to say that. But when he's trying to close that gap, he's just not a 4-3 guy. He's a 4-4 guy. And uh, I think it gets better. I don't think he's been terrible. I don't think he's even been bad. I think he's been fine. But fine isn't what you expect with him. You expect him to be good. And uh, he could get there. I think there was also a play in the Steelers game where he just – Mr. Trubisky's movement with his eyes. I was like, what are you doing, Jesse? <laughs> Nothing happened out of it, but just like one rep a game, I'm getting like the rust and the, he's not playing full speed. Like he normally is able to reading the quarterback. So well, he's breaking before he even the quarterback even pulls the pin on the grenade. I think it's just another one. It's just going to take time. And this is kind of the, you play uh, the yeah. pros and cons of sitting all these preseason games with every single starter and Samaj P. Ryan, who is, uh, I guess, the fullback now, the pass pro back. <laughs> he was last yeah. year, but I just want to give him another shout out for sp- blocking Micah Parsons with a two point conversion. One on one, lined up at tight end, not even out of the backfield to pick up a blitz or anything, just straight up blocking Mike's, Micah Parsons on the edge, one on one. The H back. Maybe that's what he is. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> I think. This is just a little bit of that trade-off. And you get a few guys that haven't even practiced much, Collins, Hendrickson, and Bates. They're all knocking off rust. They're all trying to get back to game speed. Uh, These joint practices, practices in general, they're just not the same thing as the game. And I know the preseason game is not the same thing as the game, but it's against an opponent you don't know that well. I feel like when you know your opponent really well and it's a controlled environment, it's a little bit easier to – kind of not knock that rust off the same way as an environment against somebody you don't know, a team you don't know, and you've been against opponents that, hey, some of these guys are playing for their careers. And, you know, they're playing hard, giving 100%. I'm not saying these guys don't do that in practice, but I think it is a different beast when the money's on the line. So I think this is just a little bit of the trade-off you make. Now, they almost won both these games, so I don't know. Maybe maybe hindsight's 2020 and they should have played them in the preseason – force them into practice. You can't force Jesse, but you know, try to get Hendricks and be like, Hey, don't spend time with your family. I guess. I don't know. Well, that was, it's hard. That was OTAs. That was months that was ago, OTAs. You know? Maybe I'm giving them too much yeah. slack on the not practicing, yeah, but I, I mean, it, Hendrickson was three, out there and you know, so three guys we are talking about though, they didn't practice as much as everybody else and none of them played in the preseason. So maybe that's something I think about next year is just maybe get them a series in a preseason game just to get those live reps. I don't know. It, it is something to think about. It's hard to say conclusively one way or the other how much of an impact that had. But, you know, room for improvement for this defense, room for improvement for this offensive line. And it could be that it's just taking time for these guys to, to coalesce and come together after the offseason that they had, not playing in the preseason. Certainly with a four new starting offensive linemen, there's some folks on Twitter talking about this idea that, you know, it's just going to take a few weeks. And and it could and it and it could it's be that been a all few this, weeks now. now it's, it's been two been weeks. Few weeks. It's That's been two few. weeks. So we're on That's to enough. the third, which is the few. And so, how many it could do be you that spot, we, though? If it doesn't change on, we're getting ahead. If they don't beat the Jets, guys, oh yeah, we're gonna have a, a completely different conversation next week. I think they're already in a really bad spot for the season, but that can change on a dime. And that starts this week, and it starts with them showing us that we should just forget about the first two weeks because they were rusty. But if it turns out that they weren't rusty, and there's something bigger and deeper going wrong here, and it could be the the play calling isn't right, it could be that Joe Burrow is sh- is is shook in the pocket and and isn't and and his clock is sped up, or maybe the it all settles down, right? Maybe maybe it all settles down. Remember after what the, the the Bears lost last year, James, we were saying this team isn't winning the Super Bowl if they lost to the Bears. Could say the same thing after these two games. And hey, we were right last year. They didn't win the Super Bowl, but they went. Yeah. But, and but this uh, team, this team is supposed to be better than last year's team. Absolutely. We shouldn't be talking about almost you know. winning games for their touchdown favorites. That that's bad. 
there's no sugarcoating that it's been bad, but I'm saying like they can make us forget about it. Mo but until they make honestly, us forget about it, we're going to be talking about it. Honestly, and I'm not knocking you, Mike. I think the most casual NFL fans wouldn't know the difference between Mike Santagata and Cooper Rush. Okay. So like, what are we doing? You're well, letting him go, go, go down the field and, and win. Well, I, it's just, it's crazy. It's crazy. This is the, the bills would never, the chiefs would never no. And that's what they're being mentioned with. Not the upstart Bengals from 2021. The bar is supposed to be higher now. That's all. That's what's it's, frustrating. It's supposed to be. And it's not, they're not at that level. To me, there's like five really good teams in the NFL right now, and the Bengals are, through two games, a deeply flawed team that has a lot of work to do if they want to get themselves into that conversation and get back up to the levels of the preseason hype that we had for this team. We're going to move on, and the Bengals are moving on. They need to show it, of course. Like I said, we're going to be talking about these stories until they prove us wrong. Zach Taylor said that would be the narrative. He's right. He also said that we weren't wrong for that to be the narrative. So appreciate Zach owning that, but it is time to move on to week three in the New York Jets. We've got our crossover oh, with locked on jets coming tomorrow. We've got our game preview the day after that as the Bengals prepare. Well, we're talking again about getting into the winning column until next time. Bengals fans. Thanks for listening to the locked on Bengals podcast who day and have a good one.